Thank you all for coming for another uh, Saturday where uh, I talk about issues relating to public transportation. Um, so thank you for uh, choosing to spend your time on this and not uh, on uh, going clubbing. If you if you're in Berlin, I mean we're a top clubbing city. Uh, but the topic today is not, gonna, is not gonna be about the city where I live, Berlin, but about a region where I used to live for six years, the Northeastern United States. And it's uh, commuter rail transformation efforts. Now, I have ranted about this many times for more than 10 years, but I am gonna give a brief overview of what's going on. So, uh, so to understand the overview, uh, what, is, what it's really about is to understand what American commuter rail is and how it differs from good practices. Uh, good practices that are uh, not found anywhere in the United States or in Canada, which is the country Americans are most likely uh, to have uh, heard of, and, and I don't mean heard of in the sense, I mean, Americans know that Japan exists, right? I mean, it's not like, if you ask Americans, is Japan a country, the answer is going to be yes, right? And nearly all Americans can also find Japan on a map, but when I say heard of, I mean, are capable of assimilating ideas from there. So in Canada, for, so for example, with healthcare, Americans are generally aware that Canada has single-payer healthcare, um, ones who are interested in healthcare specifically as, as a political subject, um, they know, the, I mean, they, they don't know it in a lot of detail. Um, Canadians understand America better than Americans understand Canada, but they know the, the broad outline, for example, what is, is not covered, uh, what it's like, the, the main uh, consequences of the, of the difference between Canada and the United States. Uh, but I don't even know what Japanese healthcare looks like, and I, and I have looked. Um, and, um, in, uh, and generally things that are outside North America are hard to, are hard for Americans to look at, especially for, if they're in countries that don't speak English. Now, modern commuter rail does actually exist in Britain, uh, to some extent. Uh, and it also exists to a very large extent in Australia, but it's, Australia is far, Australia is small. Um, the expression cultural cringe comes from Australia. This is a domestic thing about how Australians kind of self-abnegate their own culture and uh, uh, prefer to be late Britain and try to constantly be Britain. And so uh, even so, and, and it's a one-way trip. So British people don't really know what Australia does. And you can see this with Corona. Australia did certain things with Corona that ensured that until Delta it had very little. It had outbreaks, but it managed to contain them. And uh, the uh, and, and this was not uh, imported into Britain. None of what they did was imported into Britain, uh, let alone the US or Canada. So even though Australia speaks English, it, it has the same consultants often. Uh, the learning is generally a one-way track. So now, um, Let's discuss commuter rail. Um, commuter rail, to me, means an urban rail service that historically that historically descends from mainline rail. Um, so where I live in Berlin, we have something called the Berlin S-Bahn, um, and the Berlin S-Bahn um, is it's urban rail. It's um, so, so it's something that serves the city and the suburbs because the the main ridership uh, that you're going to get is urban, uh, and, there, and there's much more. And generally, there's more urban than outer suburban ridership. So it means uh, kind of setting up commuter rail in a way that is useful for urban service, but not just urban service. You're not going to, for example, sever things from the main line, you're practically never going to run urban-only service. Maybe it's only going to be in city limits, if it's like Berlin and city limits incorporate a lot of suburbs. Um, but you're probably going to run quite far out. Um, but you're going to run a bunch of lines together. 
usually um, with extensive branching, so that uh, in the city and in city center, it's going to uh, over it's going to uh, create an overlay that is very frequent. Um, give me a moment. What something's wrong with my computer? Um, something is still wrong with my computer. I mean, specifically, it's wrong with my display. So you're not gonna. So you're not gonna see this, but. picked a really good time for my computer to uh, stop working, i.e. a time in which it is impossible to buy a new one. Okay, fixed. So, um, or not fixed. Uh, so, le let's, what is wrong with this display? So this is the Berlin. So the Berlin S-Bahn is a good example. Uh, the, my ability to buy a new computer to replace this one, which for the record is from 2016. Um, I keep this piece of shit for another um, nine months and it's gonna get an invitation to go to school. Uh, and it's failing in the exact same way my previous two ThinkPads have failed for the record. It's, uh, it's just that now it is failing in a, at a time and place in which, oh, hi, thanks, Marky. Is it not possible to obtain a new computer in Berlin 24-7? It is not possible to obtain a new computer. Remember, there's a chip shortage. And they also need to, and they will also need to decide which one to buy. Uh, I'm going to give this another minute, and, uh, and if it just, if my computer just does not work, I'm just going to cut this because I, there's a limit to what I can deal with. Yeah, I mean the price is that I, I don't mind the price. I mind that I literally cannot get a thing that will work. Um, Yeah, I do not know what notebook prices were in February, so that does not actually help me. Um, we can, by the way, we can talk because I can see what you guys are saying on. Um, I can see what you guys are saying on uh, on on mobile. My phone is also terrible, but the display works. Okay, so this is the Berlin S-Bahn. Great. Um, the Berlin S-Bahn. No, it's not a good map. This is a good map. This is. Schematic, okay. So as you can see, uh, and th this is schematic, but it's not terribly important whether it's real or not, or whether it's, I shouldn't say real, this is real, whether it's geographic or not. So the way the Berlin S-Bahn works is you have east-west trunk line, it's called the Stadtbahn, north-south trunk line, it's called the north-south tunnel, and um, the ring. Lines go on one of these three and they, uh, interline, so you can see that there are four services using the Stadtbahn, which are S9, which goes between Spandau, at the western margin of the city, and uh, the airport. Uh, S3 going also between Spandau, but going east to a suburb called Erkner. Uh, S5 doesn't actually go that far because there's more demand east and west, so it short turns in Westkreuz, which, which is the western margin of city center. City center informally in Berlin is just the ring and everything inside it. And uh, then it goes the farthest east to Starsberg Nord. And finally, S7 uh, runs from Potsdam, which is a university town and suburb southwest of the city, through Wannsee, which is 
within the city, but it's basically a single family suburb. You may have heard of it in the Holocaust context. The Vanze conference was where the Holocaust was planned. Why? Because, uh, I mean, not why they did the Holocaust, why they chose to do it there. Well, Vanze was an, an and still is, an American style suburb. So single family, uh, um, upper middle class uh, commuters to the city. And uh, uh, this was already the thing in the 1920s and 30s. So the elite lived there. And in 1942, the elite meant senior Nazis. Um, and it goes all the way through this to uh, Ahrensfelder. Uh, this is a branch that doesn't quite fit on the main line, so they just terminated it off the top. So it goes from, it doesn't run through. Likewise, there are lines on the north south. There's lines that are on the ring, lines that run through to the ring. Um, and the point is that on the ring, trains run every four minutes tops. It's three minutes, it's three trains in 10 minutes. Uh, but it sometimes there's, there are small scenes. Maybe it's a train every four, every five, same thing with the North South, uh, tunnel. Uh, and so you can use, it's usable like the subway. So the concept is that commuter rail to me is mainline rail service. These are for the most part mainline. The Berlin S1 is old, so they run on a different electrification system. And uh, they barely ever share tracks with anything that is not the Berlin S1. I think Königswusterhausen is maybe the only exception. And uh, there are systems that have a lot more track sharing, like the Munich S1. And uh, the uh, idea is um, in the suburbs, they run less frequently, uh, maybe every 20 minutes, maybe every 10. Some systems even do every 30 minutes, like Zurich. And then they interline in the city very frequently. Uh, and all other aspects of user experience are like the subway. So what does this mean? It means that the fares are as on the subway. There's perfect fare integration. Uh, I have a monthly pass for Berlin. It costs 86 euros. And uh, this monthly pass covers all travel within the city limits of Berlin. Uh, if I ride a bus, it's covered. If I ride the subway, which is not depicted on this map, it is also covered. If I ride the S-Bahn, it is once again covered, but only within city limits. So I can go to Spandau, which is within city limits. I can go to Wannsee. Uh, uh, I can go to, uh, I don't know, uh, Sp uh, Spindlersfeld. Uh, I can go to uh, Marza. I, I, I Arensfeld actually is in the city. Uh, I can go to Ma to, to uh, Karlsdorf and to Malsdorf, but uh, I can't. Um, uh, but if I go beyond city limits, then uh, I need to buy a ticket that also lets me go to the suburbs, uh, and it's going to cost somewhat more. But within a zone, in this case the city, all modes of public transport are covered. Transfers are always free because you don't want to charge people extra for transfers. I mean, you're providing worse service, right? You're, um, you're, you're making people transfer, so don't charge extra. There's also integration between these modes. So, uh, point I'll get to in a sec. Um, and also importantly, uh, this, so this map does not depict the Uban. So let's, check Google for a moment. And uh, because I want to show you guys a neat thing about how the Uban and S-Bahn work together. Uh, so there are many S-Bahn lines that go east. The reason is that historically uh, the S-Bahn served the center of East Berlin very well. So that became the spine of the East Berlin network during division. Of course, this is you, it's. I mean, I will have to explain. I will have to point out to you all of the scenes where uh, where you can see division, but there are very few left. It's mostly just the S8 and S85 trunks here, because you'd expect that if you're in the suburbs, you want to go through city center and not divert on the ring. And the reason they do this is that this is this was West Berlin, this was suburbs, in uh, which were East Germany, East Germany, East Germany, East Germany, East Germany. So they kind of went whoop and whoop. 
Um, whereas the nor whereas this was west, and this was west, so they didn't use the north south at all. Um, but again, they, they've healed here very well. Um, so going east, a bunch of S-bahn lines, for example, S5. There's also U5, which was the spine of, of East Berlin U-Bahn, and here uh, they meet at, uh, is it, Ka at, uh, is it Karlsdorf? No, I think, no, it's Voltal, right? Um, yeah, this was going to be Voltal. Um, at Voltal, you might note that the U-Bahn and the S-Bahn are parallel. And here's how it works. The trains, is this, am I drunk? This is Voltal. This is, for some reason, Google Earth stopped. Okay, now I'm feeling like a noob for not remembering the stops in the Berlin S-Bahn by heart. Um, so it would be the second stop past him. So yes, this is Voretal. I'm sorry. In Voretal, trains run on the U-Bahn, so this, every 10 minutes, and they run on the S-Bahn every 10 minutes, and they're timed. So in the same direction, you can cross the platform and the trains will wait for each other and you can cross in both directions. So it's much more convenient. Um, so again, it's basically like extra subway lines that go farther, have somewhat more widely spaced stops uh, and are not as self-contained. Uh, so it's not one Uban line going back and forth. It's a line with has a lot of branching because you're serving both the city center and the more suburban parts of the city or sometimes actual suburbs, like this is Stassbeck. As, as I said, you uh, S5 is a long line. Um, this is what commuter rail is. This is how modern commuter rail works. And then there's American practice, which is completely different. Um, so, Pony, um, the suburb tax, I believe, is 121, and if you, uh, and if you give me one sec, I will tell you the exact cost of this because I have the app in front of me. Uh, but you know something? It's probably better to show you guys. So let's do. Uh, So fare zones uh, go, so we have three fare zones, A, which is the ring and everything inside it. No, I'm not going to take, no, I'm not going to do your cookies. Note that they're not letting me hit anything other than accept all, and it doesn't matter because I have blockers anyway. B is outside the ring, but within the city. C is the suburbs that are on the s -bahn. Uh and you buy for a minimum of, uh, and you buy for a minimum of two zones. And for some reason, they're not telling me, they're, they're not deign to tell me what the actual monthly is. Uh, so, yeah, they'll say everything when I Google, except the, what the actual price is, which, um, is annoying. Okay, so this is the normal trip cost. It's a, a, a euro ninety, right? No, it's that's your once again. Okay, this these are the prices. Uh, so three euros in the city versus three eighty if you're doing suburb to city center. Um, except nobody actually does this. Everyone is on a monthly, which they are not telling me because for some reason. The because for some reason their web design is not designed around the new user. Uh. Okay, so if like normal people you're in the monthly, 
you, it's 86. Uh, it's 86 uh, if you're doing uh, inside the city, and then 107 also in the suburbs. Uh, and uh, these are for suburbs beyond, and this is extra for suburbs beyond the S bahn if you're riding something called regional rail which is less frequent because it is not really about the city and the suburbs. It's about connecting to towns that are not, re that, I mean, have commuters, but are not as much of Berlin suburbs. So things like uh, Brandenburg under Havel, uh, Cottbus, Frankfurt under Rodel. Um, and uh, so this is commuter rail. This is regional rail in Europe. Now in the United States, the situation is different because in the United States, um, yeah, no, single trips are not inflated in the center. Single trips are just inflated because they want you to get uh, a monthly. There, it's not It's not some kind of intentional screw the tourist kind of situation. On the contrary, we have very good tourist friends. Um, so anyway, so this is good commuter rail. So let's talk about American commuter rail now because um, that is rather different. American commuter rail pretends that the year is 1960, you are Don Draper, you live in, the, you earned the income of either Don Draper or maybe not, or maybe, I mean, Don Draper was very high end even then, but maybe Pete Campbell before he moved to the suburbs. Um, but you live in a suburb like Don Draper. Uh, you are married to Betty Draper, who's going to uh, sit at home and uh, clean the house and cook your meals for you. Uh, you're going to work nine to five. If you stay in the city past about five o'clock or, or 5.30, it's because you're cheating on your wife. Uh, and you will never need to use trains for any, for any kind of travel other than your commute trip to the city. Uh, historically, it comes from the fact that um, the uh, railroads in the US felt kind of special, so they never adopted kind of urban rail innovations. And then post-war, they uh, focused on their core market, which was, again, Don Draper. So what this means is that uh, a line, first of all, is not going to have much urban service. So let's look, for example, at the, so, um, at the stops on the Berlin S-Bahn. It's not the only one, but um, it's just, it's where I live and it's a very convenient example of a very urban commuter rail service. Um, so Berlin S-Bahn is a Stadtbahn, that's the main east-west line, it's the busiest. This is this is Westkreuz, this is Ostkreuz. It's not straight, it's a little squiggly, but it's not much more than 12.6, maybe 14 or 15 kilometers. And uh, so it's about 15 kilometers, 14 or 15 kilometers, and it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 15 stops. Um, so a stop every kilometer, which is on the tight side for urban commuter rail. Paris is going to be less tight. It's going to be maybe two or three within a city um, because they were built more recently. They're kind of express overlays into the metro, but they still make all the important uh, connection points. Um, but that is urban service. Now let's discuss what the Americans do. Uh, so let's go to New York and let's look at the main line for uh, the Long Island Railroad. So uh, this is their New York station, which is called Penn Station. Uh, it's here. And they go through this tunnel and you can see the right of way here. Um, and uh, one line branches off early. This way, this looks like it's branching off. It's not. It's just for intercity trains at this point. It's there are plans to restore commuter rail here, but out of scope. And then where the main branching happens, it's here at a station called Jamaica. It's about 17 kilometers um, with the squiggles. Uh, and 17 kilometers. We don't have 15 stops. I shouldn't say we. I don't live there anymore today. It goes all the way from Penn Station without stops to here, which is called Woodside, and then to Forest Hills, which is here, Kew Gardens, and Jamaica. 
and I believe only a train every hour serves Kew Gardens and Far Sales off peak. Uh, so for the most part, trains run nonstop through the city. Uh, there's no urban service. Or again, if, if a train comes every hour in the city, it might as well not exist. So the differences are uh, much less emphasis in urban service to the point that there's no emphasis in urban service. It's all about the suburbs. It's suburbs that, especially in New York, have a very strong we are not the city identity. I keep telling them, let's be like the subway. And they think that the that if they're gonna be if it's gonna be like the subway, then black people are gonna stab them. They don't say black people, they say they they use euphemisms, but that's what they mean. Um and um service is almost exclusively also at rush hour. Uh so um let's try to find some good L I R R timetable. Uh, let's do Babylon branch. So you can keep changing these like Babylon branch, uh, Port Jefferson branch and so on. And you will get the branches for the LIRR. It's pretty nice this way. The Metro North requires you to inquire the internal name of the, uh, of the month the timetable is in. By the way, this might have, uh, this is possibly going to look a little less peaky than it usually is because they cut mostly peak service during Corona. But still, look. Uh, how many trains enter from this Babylon place? How many enter um, Penn Station between 7 and 8? It's 1, 2. Oh, this might be a far but it doesn't matter. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then 8 to 9. And by the way, I'm skipping all the ones say J because they're going to other destinations and it's a change in Jamaica, but we should possibly also add them later. From eight to nine, it's one, two, three, four, five. And this is again Corona. Before Corona, it was, I believe, seven. Off peak, the trains run half hourly. Um, and there's an almost hour long gap between 10 and 11. Also here, remember, we're not counting change to Jamaica trips, so this is a longer than half hour uh, gap. So maybe six trains-ish, and more if you include the change to Jamaica ones. At the rush hour, half an hour, and there's a single hour, um, one hour gap of peak. So they don't actually try to, yeah, uh, yeah. and so when you say they used to have a bunch of stops, yes. Then the subway was built and it killed them. Because remember how we talked about fares? These are not integrated fares. I buy a train ticket on the subway in New York. I pay MetroCard fare. I buy one in. I buy one that uses that is between the same stops. Let's say Jamaica and Penn Station, which can be connected um, by the LIR or by the E train. The E train will charge me subway fare, which is. A, Last time I was there, it was 120 something per month, dollars, not euros, obviously. It may have increased by a little bit. And the fares on the LIRR are a multiple of that. LIRR fares, I guess we're going to do 2021, LIRR and Metro North fares. And um, so it's premium fares, very little off peak frequency. Uh, Long Island Railroad fares. Uh, so Jamaica is zone three, Penn Station is in zone one, zone three to zone one is 234. This is approximately twice the subway fare. If you don't buy a monthly, it's actually a larger multiplier because commuter rail in America gives you bigger discounts on monthly fares than the subway. Um, because commuter rails, I mean, the, the term commuter comes from commutation, i.e., uh, early, 19, uh, maybe mid to late 19th century examples of giving frequent riders a discount. I think at the time it was uh, discounted 10 trips, then discounted monthlies. Uh, on the subway, it's a more recent invention, so they try to be stingier about it. Um, so different fares in America. Type, um, schedules that have no integration. The, the idea that you do any kind of coordinated planning People will stare at you if, you if you suggest that. In Boston, for example, the, uh, there are quite a lot of buses uh, that feed uh, transit centers in outlying cities, and they might even be co-located with a train station. This is the case in Framingham, Worcester, which is jurisdictionally the second largest city in New England. Um, 
more or less only number four or five or something, but still pretty hefty. Uh, low um, feature all of these have their own little town bus networks that converge in the city center on a transit center, which is co-located with the train station, but the schedules are not actually integrated. So, as I said, um, um, very little off-peak frequency, premium fares, uh, where they overlap. So I don't mean that it's more expensive to ride between Lowell and Boston, which is a long distance in, than within Boston. I mean that within Boston, it's usually more expensive to ride commuter rail um, than, than the subway. Uh, no schedule integration, no fare integration. So if you switch, you have to pay a second fare. Um, planning is completely separate. So they, for example... Are you they, um, so they're kind of frozen in mid twentieth century practices? Like conductors come in and individually collect people's tickets because that's what they used to do. Uh, there's this mentality that was uh, articulated by former MBTA general manager Frank De Paola: commuter rail is not mass transit; it's its own thing. It's commuter rail. Um, so uh, and finally, very little urban service. That is somewhat changing. Uh, let me see if you can see this on Google Earth with the Fairmount line. So the Fairmount line is this one. Yeah, okay. You can see there are more stops here. These are mostly recent reopenings, uh, but the trains still run every forty minutes. Uh, and uh, ridership did increase when they reduced. So there's no fare integration on the Fairmount line. The fares were reduced to be the same as on the subway at all but the outermost two stations. But you need to pay a second fare if you change. So the, the subway is very efficiently fed by buses with free transfers. The commuter trains are not. Um, and if you don't work at South Station, but let's say Cambridge, and you want to change to the red line, so the red line goes this way, um, then uh, you have to pay a second fare. Um, so it's only partial fare integration. It's still triple their, and they still triple the ridership when they cut the fares. Um, and, uh, but on other lines, you can see there's not a lot of stops here. So the orange line makes a couple stops here, then a couple stops up to here. But the commuter rail runs non-stop over a long period. It's from here from Forest Hills to here, which is called Hyde Park. Um, and, so, and the commuter trains, you can even see that the ridership distribution tightens outside the city because the whole point of commuter rail in America is to be suburban. It's to serve, again, Don Draper, who can live in any suburb. Um, Chicago is probably the biggest example of this. If it can't find, if Google Earth does not work, it will just show you the stop distribution. I actually wrote it down at one point. Um, Google has just gotten bad at depicting train stations. Yeah, it's not actually hard to get rid of the conductors. Um, the, I mean, yes, it requires sending people pink slips. These are people who uh, are moralized as like the deserving working class um, with kind of social privileges that are never going to be extended to, let's say, Volt drivers who bike, but they're fireable. I mean, you, you hand them the pinks, like, what are they going to do about it? I mean, you want to, I mean, if you're getting rid of all of them, they can't exactly strike. I mean, this stri strike is a one out, all out principle. Uh, this is literally wanting to do a full layoff. So you can see that these are very long interstations. Um, you probably want to scale. So this is three kilometers, which is, in, but it's not awful. I mean, it, it's, it's done on express line. This is five, which is, more questionable and then this interstation is three and a half and you might object wait Alon, you're saying that there should be more stops but what would the stop even serve here this is rail yards well yeah if there are rail yards you build a stop then you build housing next to the stop um, and then you go to the suburbs and you can see how this is tightening so you normally there's more density in the city than in the suburbs. So when the relative density is higher, you should have tighter stop spacing. This is the thing for everything. It's also an important principle of bus stop spacing. Um, and here it's the opposite. The density is higher in the city, but there, there's that five kilometer gap or three kilometer gap. And here, in three kilometers, there are three stations. In five, there are five stations. Um, 
once you go into the suburbs. And this is the busiest commuter line in Boston. This is not some weird has-been. It is, I mean, it's technologically a weird has-been, but it is a thing that serves the um, suburbs of Boston, uh, not of Boston, of Chicago in this direction, and only the suburbs, not the city. The city can ride slow buses. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, and you're definitely right. Um, metro, so this can also, uh, in America, be the result of jurisdictional disputes. Um, in Chicago, the county runs metro. The city runs the urban trains. Uh, and especially now, the two people in charge hate each other because they ran in the runoff against each other for the Chicago, in the Chicago mayoral election. So, um, and the, so the county is run by um, Perwinkle and the city by Lightfoot. And as a result, uh, integration, like for example, at Hyde Park, AKA University of Chicago, this is served by, so this is a commuter line. It's called Metro Electric. It's the only electric line. And uh, there are perennial plans to uh, fair integrate it with, and, and, uh, and increase the frequency. And uh, the reason I think Chicago, and the reason it's not even seriously studied, unlike in the Northeast, is that uh, it would involve cooperation between the city and the county. And again, the mayor and the county exec keep sniping at each other. So instead, the mayor wants to do an all L or all bus solution for this part of the city, including an extension of the L here to an area already served by Metro Electric. Um, sometimes, so about re, um, separate agencies or not, um, in practice, it's always separate. So even though in all of the cities that I've mentioned so far, so Boston, New York, and Philly, which are going to be my focus right now, and Chicago, there's an overarching agency. In New York, it's the MTA, which omits New Jersey Transit, but actually New Jersey Transit is not the biggest and, and most glaring example of disintegration. Boston yeah, has the MBTA. Philly has SEPTA, Chicago has RTA. In practice, they're managerially different. So the idea that, for example, you can have a manager go between one and the other, that's not a thing. They have separate planner pools, separate worker pools. Um, and in all cases, the commuter rail drivers get paid a lot more than the subway drivers. There's a lot of resentment among the subway drivers about this. And uh, not much is being done. Uh, the, uh, I should also add that there's a racial component to this. The subway drivers uh, are, for the most part, not white in all of these four cities. Even Boston, the metropolitan area of Boston, is substantially whiter than the other three. The other three... Actually, maybe no, Philly is also whiter than New York and Chicago. New York is about... Metro New York is about 50% white. Chicago... Probably about the same. Philly, maybe sixty something. Boston, I think, is the like seventy percent white one or something like that. And even in Boston, uh, subway drivers and the bus drivers predominantly people of color. Commuter rail, very white, uh, and gets paid extra. Uh, and uh, because the United States does not have any kind of civil rights enforcement, it has civil rights lawsuits. Things that are within tradition, like that, or like the separate school districts. Uh, can say the same. And uh, so, um, the, and, and remember, the MBTA, which is a coordinated agency, there it was the uh, uh, general manager who said commuter rail is not mass transit, it's commuter rail. So it's not like, so, so it's not exactly a matter of the org chart in theory, it's the org chart in practice. They feel autonomous. They feel special, the commuter trains. Now, Change has happened. No, change has been happening for a bunch of reasons. The first is uh, there's always been this understanding that there's better public transport in other countries than in the United States, and um, I think at some point it came to a head. Um, I don't think it's a construction cost issue. It's separate, um, and a lot of it is not coming from me. Uh, much of it comes from Chris, from Christoph Spieler, who I will talk about in a second. But um, uh, but it's. People who, but, but the difference in quality is so big that even Americans can at some point get foreign ideas uh, to some extent. 
And, uh, and I'll explain why I'm saying to some extent in a second. And another issue is there's uh, urban mid the, the new urban middle class is not on Draper. Um, the new urban middle class doesn't have this thing of oh I live in Long I live on Long Island. My wife does all the um, actual work that does not involve yelling at uh, my employees uh, to work harder. Uh, and uh, we have two cars, and if there's any house here, anything here that is not a single-family house, then I am going to, uh, and by I mean my wife, uh, is going to uh, scream about what about the children, and it's going to bring drugs to the neighborhood. Um, so this kind of NIMBYism, so there's kind of a new middle class that doesn't care for this NIMBYism. I think it's related also to the growth of EMB. Um, so, uh, be so between that, between the fact that people are suddenly taking a step to say, wait, why is this this kind of transit apartheid where um, in New York you have faster LRR trains from the suburbs that, that go to the Jamaica Penn Station for twice the price of a subway train between Jamaica and Penn Station? What the hell? Um, so there's been a lot of reform in Paris, um, mostly by people who are my age, maybe a few years older or a lot younger. Um, again, not all of them. Jim Aloisi is a boomer and has been good at this. Uh, um, Christoph Spieler, I do not know how old he is. I think he's Gen X. My guess is that he's 50. Uh, and uh, so let's discuss the reforms that should happen. So the reforms that should happen, that's not actually that much of a long discussion. It just means take all accumulated knowledge of American commuter rail, and for Canadian, which is the same, set it on fire, replace it with the accumulated knowledge of places where it works. So Japan, Germany, France, Switzerland is excellent. Uh, to some extent, Britain and Australia. They're kind of, I'm, it's one pattern. They're very similar. Actually, more than Germany and Switzerland are to each other. Uh, Spain, Italy, the Netherlands, Sweden. You, Korea, you look at what they do, you learn, you implement. The laws of physics are the same. The differences in infrastructure uh, standards are very easily fixable. Now, what's actually being done is something a lot slower. And this is what I'm going to get into in a sec. It's kind of all about how to preserve the management experience of the managers who have failed, um, which is why there's a lot of governance by pilot here. Uh, rather than just um, ripping the band-aid off. Um, so let's discuss um, let's discuss New York last actually. Um, I think Philadelphia and Boston are doing better are both doing better. So um, I don't have good slide decks for these. Um, so I'm gonna do the slide deck that I do have for Boston. Um, it is called Regional Urban Rail Transformation. It is something that began mostly in the pandemic. There, some of this was accelerated in the pandemic because the pandemic killed the Don Draper ridership. Um, commuter rail ridership essentially got obliterated during the lockdowns um, and work from home because these are all middle-class people who can work from home. And uh, I, I believe Boston commuter rail was at 4% of its pre-corona ridership. Not that the subway was doing well. The subway was in the teens, I think. But teens versus 4% is a big difference. Uh, so they realized, huh, and because also we at Transit Matters have been yelling at them about it, look for re um, regional rail down under. Now, I said at the beginning, regional rail connects the city to things that are not really its suburbs. Commuter rail is within the city and its inner suburbs. In America, the terminology is different. In America... People got used to commuter rail meaning bad commuter rail. So when they say regional rail, they mean both what we here in Germany call commuter rail or S-Bahn and what we here in Germany call regional rail or regionalbahn. These are subsumed under the header regional rail in America. Commuter rail is in American activist lingo stuff that only runs one, nine to five and will do you a favor by running hourly off peak um, or reverse peak. So I bring this report up. First, because you should read it, and second, because uh, um, it's actually had impact, and like we've managed to yell at the MBTA into 
not just blocking bad things, but also doing good things. Um, but again, it's all um, it, it's it's all in trickles, unfortunately, and there's not enough interest in doing actual transformation. Um, we don't need this. We don't need this. We don't need this. We do need this. So, what does it mean transformation? And this is remember from March 2021. So, as the uh, alpha wave was being suppressed through vaccination, but not during complete exit. Uh, so uh, they talk about electrification. We keep harping on the importance of electrification. Um, so at the end of the day, passengers care about rider about about. I almost said ridership now. Passengers care about the drivers of ridership, like frequency and speed. Uh, but essentially, every important city here has electrified, has fully electrified commuter and often also regional trains. Um, for example, in Berlin, we electrified in the 1920s and 30s. Remember I mentioned Wannsee as, uh, as, as a kind of elite American-style suburb? Well, that was the first to be electrified uh, because it was the busiest line, because it had early suburbanization. Um, but everything was electrified by, um, um, by World War II. Um, this was done both before and after the Nazis took over. Um, and, uh, in, uh, and, and likewise, uh, generally in the first two thirds of the 20th century, um, and I don't just mean Berlin, all, all cities of note electrified, uh, in Europe at this point where the, like the frontier of electrification here is something like Dresden or Trondheim. Uh, Trondheim is in Norway because this is a city that's small enough. I'm not going to say its name and expect everyone to have heard of it. This is Trondheim. This is a city that is currently electrifying its trains. They run hourly peak. Also, I believe hourly off. There are two lines. I believe they each run hourly peak and off peak. Uh, metro area. It's not completely true because probably you want to do Trondheim region or Trentela. Uh, how many people live in, in Trentela? Okay, half a million. Sorry, not 300,000. Half a million. This is the frontier of electrification in Norway because everything bigger, for example, Oslo has been electrified. Boston is the size of Berlin and is fully unelectrified. But they are right, however, it is a means to an end. Uh, it's just bullshit slide deck. So what they're actually proposing is clock face scheduling, uh, which is something we taught them. But um, I shouldn't say we, just we taught them because the person in charge is called Alice, is, is called uh, Alistair Stores. He's British. Britain is not as good at these clock face schedules as Germany, but it, it has them. So a clock face schedule or a tact means that the trains repeat. It means that the timetable repeats. So if there is a train from, let's say, where I live, so let's call it Ostbahnhof. It's one of the main intercity stations. It's not the it's not the intercity station of Berlin, but it's one of them. If there's a train from Ostbahnhof going east on uh, the regional trains, not commuter trains, regional trains, to, uh, let's say, uh, Frankfurt an der Rode, so this one, uh, at, uh, I'm going to make up a number because there's a real one that I don't remember. Let's say it leaves at 8.25 in the morning. It means at X25 every hour, there is a train from Ostbahnhof leaving toward Frankfurt an der Rode because this is a line that runs. Our, it's technically two hour, two lines that run hourly together. They try to overlay every half hour. I don't think they do a very good job at it, but that's a separate question. And likewise, uh, a train to uh, uh, and likewise trains in other directions to other such suburbs. And I shouldn't call not call and I shouldn't call these suburbs to outlying cities that you can commute to Berlin from, but few people do because it's eighty kilometers. And unlike in Boston, we actually do have affordable housing that is not in Frankfurt on the Rodel. Um, then again, it's going to repeat every hour. Maybe it repeats every half an hour. The S-Bahn is also an attack that repeats every 20 minutes or 10 minutes on some lines. So they actually wrote schedules where the trains run every 10 minutes and they made sure that they end in the same units digit all day, every day. 
um, if they want extra service at rush hour, which is not common in the German way of running trains, but does sometimes exist, usually what you do is you interpolate. So um, it's not done in Berlin, because in Berlin, we all, all of our supplemental peak service terminates outside, so things like trains that run only from Ostbahnhof East rather than through the Stadtbahn or through the North-South Tunnel. But the standard way to do it is maybe if you're on every 10 minutes at, uh, you know, at an even time, so uh, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes after the hour, then maybe at rush hour you will add trains 5, 15, 25, 35, 45, 55 minutes after the hour. That is legit clock face. Um, we could do the Parisian way, which is there's an off-peak clock face, and then they break it at rush hour and just run service wherever, on the theory that if the trains run every two and a half minutes, then nobody's going to look at the timetable, which is correct. And the implication, which is that on the branches where trains run every 10 minutes at rush hour, where people still don't care about the schedule, this is incorrect. So Paris is inferior on the implementation of, uh, in French it's called horaire condensé, here it's called a tact, in English it's called clock face. Um, to the German implementation, the British way is, it's also, a, it, it's kind of like also in the condensé, but um, they don't try to use this to, uh, for example, have time transfers between the subway and the commuter trains, whereas here they do. So, so at, at any rate, clock free schedule is something we've been yelling at them about a lot for the last three and a half years. Uh, but source specifically would know it from home. Um, they're talking about maybe 20 or 30 minute headways uh, um, on the uh, trains that are not necessarily peak demand, but they're always, but, but you know, they're doing local and also Peaky Express is kind of a weird overlay um, because they can't let go of, uh, because they can't cut out the Don Drapers. They can't say, say to the Don Drapers, yeah. Actually, so first of all, we're going to run the trains better, so you're not going to have slower trips, but yeah, your trips are going to have some black people deal. Um, and um, this is kind of the wish list, which is a good wish list for the most part. The express service bit doesn't need to be there. Um, and uh, importantly, let's talk about phase one. So as I mentioned, it's government by... Uh, it's governed by pilot, so they're not doing everything. They're doing this is the Providence line. Uh, it might not look much, but it's actually a very long line. So let's uh, and, and if Google Earth does not work, I'm just gonna boot my uh, crayon, which I am not gonna upload. Also, even though I know people like seeing my crayon, uh, and uh. I mean, a few of those things are... Okay, so some of these lines don't exist. Like uh, from Stoughton to here, it's called South Coast Rail, and it's under construction in the worst done way possible. Uh, this exists. This ex Well, not this station, but up until here it exists. This exists. This exists until Middleborough, and this is an extension that only runs uh, weekends during the summer. This exists, this exists, this this is the Providence line. So it's connecting Boston to Providence, which morally is New England's second city. Um, I think jurisdictionally it's the fourth. This is where I used to live, actually. So I used to live here. Uh, uh, on the east side, so this would have been... So in, in this neighborhood called Fox Point, I used to live, I believe, here. Maybe here. Um, so I would walk 20 minutes to the train station and then take a train, which would take an hour to get to uh, Boston. And these are trip times that I thought could be done with electrification. I have better timetables than these, and an actually professional map looking like this will be out soon. This is just me showing you where the lines are in a way that can actually be visible on a geographic map. This is to Worcester. Um, so... Um, the Providence line is long, and this is the Stoughton branch of it, but this Providence line is already wired. They're running diesels under wire. The intercity trains are electric. The commuter trains were uninterested in the 90s. The MBTA was uninterested in the 90s. Um, there are a few things that are not electrified that um, only commuter trains use. For example, Adelboro is a four-track station. Uh, it is used as uh, overtakes, which are not done on a clock-based basis. Normally, when you want to do overtakes on a 
line mixing local and express trains, uh, the way you do it is you have these four track stations and you run both of them on the same clock phase schedule so that you always have the same overtakes, but America does not do that. So here, the uh, only the central tracks used by intercity trains are electrified and the and the outer tracks are not. But this is a short thing. They can just wire. It's easy. And they can piggyback off the transformer. Uh, Fairmount. This is Fairmount. I mentioned this before. Um, this is also on the list to be electrified because it is an urban line. It is the lowest income line in the system. Essentially, everyone here lives in these neighborhoods, which are some of the poorest in Boston. Um, bo quick Boston urban geography. Poor people. Poor people, poor people, poor people, wealthier people. So they move the orange line from uh, here, where it would serve poor people, to here, which looks very close. But um, Boston street network is not very easy. So poor people, random streets that make you zigzag, richer people. This used to have a subway, and now the subway is here. Uh, very rich people, very rich people, middle class, rich people who think that they're not rich, rich people, rich people and 10 people in subsidized affordable housing, uh, middle class people but ri getting richer every time, uh, mix working to middle class, poor people. Um, and I emphasize poverty because um, the third line, so they're talking about starting with the Providence line because it's already wired and it's the highest ridership. Uh, Fairmount because it's very short, it can piggyback off the transformers for the Providence lines. Uh, many stops benefit electrification because electrification doesn't just increase your top speed, it improves your acceleration. Electric trains are incredibly powerful, especially when they're self-propelled. It's called EMUs, electric multiple units. When you ride the subway, there is no locomotive. It's because the trains are multiple units. This is how all modern trains work. Uh, every subway in the world is EMUs. Nearly all high-speed trains in the world are EMUs because of the demographic weight of China and Japan. Uh, also, Taiwan is all EMU. Uh, Germany is not all, but mostly EMU. Uh, Spain is a mix. Italy, I believe, is... All EMU. France is the main holdout of not doing EMUs. Korea started with French trains, but I believe it's transitioning to EMUs. Yeah, no, the TGV is a holdout on these things. Like the, the French people think they're special. Uh, yes, uh, and of course, the orange line, the MBTA, yes. The MBTA promised that they would get equivalent or better service. They got them BRT, i.e., bus lanes i.e. double parking lanes, because a cop is not going to enforce the bus lane because the cop thinks that if you uh, use any mode of travel other than the car, you are not fully human. It is a thing for American cops that is independent of their racism somehow. So it's not like they are nice to white cyclists, but brutal to black cyclists. They also brutalize white cyclists, less than they do black cyclists, but they brutalize white cyclists. Streets blog would constantly talk about how um, cops would literally steal people's bikes. Not not like as a random thief. I mean, I mean, uh, they would impound them on the flimsiest of pretexts, um, and they don't enforce the bike lanes. Um, and likewise with the bus lane. Um, and so the third line, and on top of Providence and Fairmont, that is being transformed is Eastern. Now, by the way, this branch does not exist. This is proposal. Um, now, you'd think they would electrify the whole thing, but no, they're half-assing it. Go again, governed by pilot, governed by trying to do everything as a kind of uh, uh, weird means test. And they say weird means test because it's not actually means test. They just try to mostly serve poor areas, so they go only to Salem or Beverly. Um, I think also actually to Beverly. So they're going to plan on wiring this. But not the branches. But much of the uh, but much of the frequency on this comes from trains coming from the branches. So I imagine that they're just going to have to give up and wire everything. Um, they could do it out of one transformer, so it's not a big problem. It's just going to require them to make a logical leap that is difficult for them because remember, governance by pilot, governance by 
doing things at the pace that a manager who does not know that Germany has commuter trains, in which category I constantly emphasize SORS is not. SORS has very British experience and probably too little German experience, but SORS is not that ignorant. It's the people who tell SORS that certain things cannot be done who are that ignorant. And um, so only three lines are going to be wired, and it's really two and a half because Eastern is only going to be half wired. Um, they even call it the environmental justice line because they can't even use their real name. They call it the poor people. And environmental justice is an American uh, euphemism at this point for poor people. Uh, and uh, they are talking about things like fair integration, uh, about better trains, and again, they're uh, about better rolling stock, but again, it's halting. They talk about things like mix of battery and catenary. Remember Trondheim, the city of half a million in the, the, the metro area, I shouldn't say city, of half a million in Norway with hourly trains? They're not doing battery, they're doing wire. Norway is basically the world's battery electric vehicle capital at this point. They don't do wire on the trains in Trondheim. The, they do, sorry, they do wire, they don't do battery on the trains in Trondheim. They do uh, battery on rural branch lines, not on things serving a, uh, not, not on things serving a, a, a metropolis of half a million, let alone a metropolis that is larger than the entire population of Norway. Um, uh, there are also certain problems that they don't realize. For example, they talk about elimination of bridge clearance issues. Boston has no bridge clearance issues. Uh, so Boston absolutely does have bridge clearance issues if you insist the trains have to be as tall as the trains that they want, but they don't. Um, EMUs, the, uh, a normal single-deck European EMUs, fit under the bridges with the catenary, with all the clearances for high voltage catenary, with space to spare. Um, they're also being very slow about it. Um, so the phase one, they think that, so they talk about pilot, they talk about environmental reviews only being done by 2025. Uh, operating, they, essentially they make everything slow. So service is only to open 2029. Yeah, um, so yeah, level boarding. So, so with the TSI platform issue, one of the things you really need as you do on the subway is level boarding. So same height on the platform and the train, but a lot of regional rail systems here actually don't have it. In Berlin, we do. In Munich, they partly do. In Paris, they partly do. The thing is, um, traditionally, subways were maybe a meter tall platforms, and this is also the case for the Berlin next one. I think it's 960 millimeters. And uh, because Europe had such a large installed base of usable but lower platforms where you have two steps onto the train, um, they standardized on different things, not on 960 or anything like that, but 550 and 760. Um, High-speed EMUs are even higher. They're, they start from a meter and go up to about a meter 25. Again, a lot of it is weight of Japan and China, which just built de novo systems at a meter 25. Um, uh, and there's probably eventually going to be a high-speed train in Europe, a high-speed EMU in Europe that boards to 760, 550 is probably a pipe dream. Uh, that said, in the United States, 550 and 760 are alien to them, um, and they actually have a large installed base in the northeast of four feet, so 1220. Uh, in New York, on the LIRR and Metro North, everything is that already. They actually went full high platform. Uh, much of New Jersey Transit is. Boston and Philly are partly that and partly low platforms, but not 550 low, like no platform low or 200 millimeter low with three or four steps, with three steep steps up very narrow doors. So they have to fix this anyway. So might as well fix it and go high platform. You don't need TSI compliant platforms for this. And it's actually not hard to raise the floor height. It's uh, lowering the floor height. That's the hard part. Um, and yeah, the internal steps are annoying and not really wheelchair accessible, um, to which a standard answer to disabled people is unfortunately fuck off and die. And uh, But again, 
disability accessibility laws are getting tighter. Um, and we're actually pretty good here at stuff like elevators and ramps at every station on the Berlin U-Bahn and S-Bahn. Um, and uh, yeah, they're trying to talk about dual mode locomotives, which is something that they've been insisting on for many years back when they, uh, let me go back to Korea. This black thing is a tunnel called the North-South railing that does not exist that they're proposing. Should we be able to, when I say we, I'm, this is not like a TM idea. This is an idea that goes back to the, as a real plant with the eighties. Uh, it was descoped from the big dig because of the big digs costs, but it is, uh, but actually a lot of the prep work was already done. Ho however, the big dig made people in Boston think that tunnels are too expensive. So even though they did all the expensive part for the North South railing, they still aren't refusing to build it again, governed by pilots. It's not a pilot. This is four or $5 billion. It's not just a black line because you would need to, the portals go up into like here and here and maybe probably under the river. So here. Um, it's about four or five billion dollars. Um, and uh, so they don't want to build it, so they pretend it's going to cost a lot more, but even four to five is a hefty sum. Uh, and so uh, the original plan for the 90s for the North F, for the North South Railing assumed that trains would have dual mode locomotives, so partly diesel, partly electric. These are awful, awful products. You should not use them in, under any circumstance ever. They're very heavy, they're unreliable, they are very expensive. Um, anywhere where you think of using one, just electrify the whole way, you will be happier this way, and much more importantly than you, your riders will be happier. Um, but again, it's governed by pilots, so they think, oh, let's not electrify, let's build a tunnel where electrification costs a lot less than the tunnel. Um, and, uh, the, and yes, New Jersey Transit has these ALP uh, 45s. This is exactly what I was talking about. I believe they cost $8 million a unit or something like that. A locomotive should cost you five, but you should also never use locomotives for passenger rail. You should use EMUs. An EMU should cost you $2.5 million in the normal American length. Um, it's prorated to length, actually, and here in Euroland, um, we don't use the normal American length for EMUs if they're single deck, only if they're double deck. If they're single deck, they're about three quarters the size, so it should be three quarters the price. Um, and the trains are a longer number of cars, it's not like all their trains are small. Munich has trains that are equivalent to eight American cars. Uh, Paris has eight to nine American cars on the RER. Um, so, so it's not like it's all small trains, it's just they're divided into more cars and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter very much. Um, I like standardization, so I like the American length, but it's just me liking having something to explain to people. Um, so unfortunately, they're talking about uh, midlife overhaul, like more diesels, um, because they don't think of, for example, uh, first of all, accelerating the uh, environmental, which can always be, can always be done. I mean, the, a lot of the stuff is slow because politicians uh, like using uh, the civil services whipping boys. So when the, uh, so they will never accelerate unless a politician is willing to take responsibility. The current person in charge, Governor Baker, takes responsibility for nothing. And uh, the, um, and, and for the record, um, and, and I've said this before to someone who's written this, uh, not high speed rail, so that's something we're about to move on to, but the stuff we've already done um, with Boston, um, the green line extensions costs. Um, again, that's not commuter rail, that's, that's not what I'm talking about, but um, there is one similarity, and this is a story in which there are many, many factors that went wrong. Repeat, there are many, many factors that went wrong. Oh, right, cases, not projects. Projects is a subway project. Our work is not projects. Our work is cases. So this is Boston. Um, um, the, there are six cities there. Only one is done. Two more will be done very soon. So with the caveat, there are many problems at hand, like a commuter rail civil service that is not good. If there's one villain to the story of Boston infrastructure, his name is Charlie Baker. 
not just in his capacity as governor now, but even more so in his capacity as uh, the budget director for Governor Weld in the early 90s, uh, who essentially gutted state capacity. Um, if you live in Massachusetts, there's an election next year. Work on fixing that, please. Um, so you need a politician who's willing to take responsibility. So phase one environmental is not this. It's probably more like this, then procurement, then you electrify. Um, you can generally open full electrification within eight years. Um, and some things will open earlier as things come online, especially on the Providence line, because you need very little extra info. So we're talking about first steps here, which again, is mostly uh, trying to realign the timetable, but even the timetable. Uh, so, so as I mentioned, there's a gap in Elboro, uh, acquire a Buy America compliant rolling stock. Buy America is a federal law. They can use Massachusetts money for this. Um, Massachusetts is a wealthy state. It can spend its own money. It's not a lot of money. It's a couple train set. It's a couple train sets. A train set building partnerships, and they're talking about the timetable here. You see targeting headways. Um, you might notice something. They are running the Fairmount line every 45 minutes. The most urban line has not the best frequency because Beverly gets 30. Um, it is not clock phase. Clock phase means it needs to divide 60. Do you know what 60 divided by 45 is? It is not, a, it is not an integer. Um, some places, they really hate the outer branches around outer branches in Munich, for example, every 40 minutes, but that's on a two hour cycle. 45 minutes is on a, um, uh, 45 minutes is on a longer cycle. That's on a, uh, th that's what, four trains in three hours. It's a three hour cycle. Um, by the way, if you're wondering about 120, two hours, a two hour attack is attacked. Should never do that on regional rail, only on, low ridership intercity rail, but it's a thing. Um, so this should be 60. Um, this actually should be 15, but um, there's, but Fairmount is getting the worst. Fairmount could get 20. Uh, I heard an excuse for why they're gonna do this on Fairmount. And by the way, they have fixed things. Like they have made things more clock face. Um, so it's not all bad. It's just somehow they're, screwing over uh, Dorchester again, because uh, I, I think the, there was some excuse about how they uh, need to do some midday maintenance so they can't run very frequently, because again, it's people, like the people in the commuter rail civil service don't ride the trains off beep. They don't live in, Dor in Dorchester. If they do, they're about to white flee. They don't think of the riders in Dorchester as fully human who can go to the same schools as them without having rocks thrown at their buses. And that's the, and that's the result. And instead of telling them, bullshit, move the, uh, bullshit, move the uh, uh, midday uh, maintenance to some uh, other time, like you do on all the other lines and stop complaining, um, they instead bought their excuses. So overall, a mixed thing, okay? I mean, again, there are real good things that are being done here. Um, like they're starting to electrify. Uh, in Newton, importantly, so all of these stations, all these three stations exist. This is an infill we're proposing. This is an infill that I am proposing. This exists. This is under construction. Infill that I am proposing exists. Infill that probably needs to let go, be let go of because this and this are both really constrained locations. Exists, exists. These stations only have a platform on one of the two tracks. It's also a low platform, no accessibility. And uh, due to the work of Transit Matters, but not me of Transit Matters, uh, we managed to scuttle a weird plan to uh, move one of the platforms here to the wrong side. So to, to, the, uh, to make it also a single track platform, but on the other track, so trains would have to slow on. Uh, if you're wondering how trains work on this, uh, there's no reverse peak service. Peak service uses the track that has the platforms, reverse speak the track that doesn't have platforms. But at this point, they're realizing they're going to need to build the um, high platforms on both sides of the tracks uh, at higher cost. It's a very constrained area, so the costs are higher than normal. And also with the overpasses designed to accommodate electrification. So they're realizing that eventually they're going to wire. They just keep punting on one.
Um, so good things, again, are happening in Boston in bits and pieces, um, but no overall uh, vision uh, is the best way to describe it. Um, or if there is a vision, it's very compromised. What sort of city pair in terms of size would I say qualifies as low ridership? To put things in perspective, here is a place called uh, Watertown. I believe there are 100,000 people, there are 100, not 100, 100,000 people here. There's a military base here called Fort Drum, which uh, is for the 10th Mountain Division. Um, yes, I've been spending far too much time reading military things, so I actually know American military things. The county has 100,000 people. There's a historic railway. I shouldn't say historic, it might sound legacy. There's an existing legacy railway without passenger rail between Watertown and Syracuse, metro population 800,000. This should run minimum hourly. Why can it run minimum hourly between such tiny places? Well, because it's not like there's Syracuse and there is Watertown and Fort Drum and everything else has been carpet nuked. No, there's Albany, there's Utica and then Albany and then New York in the other direction. I mean, most of New York is the important thing, but also in the other direction, Rochester, Buffalo, Toronto. So you can run trains and using the magic of intercity clock face timetabling and coordinated planning, you can even make sure the trains are timed. So the idea is that at Syracuse, you could have trains enter from all four directions, east from New York, which is going to be very frequent uh, at uh, full high-speed rail buildup, from the west, which is also frequent uh, because Toronto is a thing, um, from the north, which is probably going to be hourly maybe to Watertown. I can see half hourly with tiny trains, but hourly is probably more supportive. Uh, more supportable, unfortunately, and maybe south. You need to, um, you know, you might need to uh, rebuild some lines, but that gets you to Cortland, and eventually you can get to Ithaca and Cornell. Um, and then all of, and then do things where trains from the south and the north meet at the same time in Syracuse, and trains from the east and the west are also going to let you exchange passengers, so you can get from anywhere to everywhere with very short wait times. So to put so when I say there are some lines where a certain, where a train every two hours is acceptable, bear in mind that they do not include Syracuse to Watertown among them. There are things in tiny places in Norway where I can I can see that happen. Remember, Oslo as a metropolitan area is roughly the size of Rochester or Buffalo. Um, Trondheim is smaller than Syracuse, much more urban, less. Uh, sprawly but still it's very small and the commuter trains in trondheim run hourly um so things that are truly remote yeah i can get where they can run less than hourly but even upstate new york for example no uh yeah um south to binghamton you're right you're right so um to ithaca and also to binghamton um, and then Binghamton is a really annoying one because um, there's, it's never going to be on a high speed line to New York. Um, it's going to be on medium speed lines, and some of these are going to be really slow slogs up to the Poconos. So New York, Str Scranton, Binghamton. Um, try to get it as fast as possible on uh, the legacy trains, but bear in mind that the legacy line looks like this. Um, so hack it's down. That's so there are parts of it that are called the Lackawanna cutoff, which Google Earth is not showing me, which are very fast, and then it goes into a very slow slog. This is the one. Oh, no, this is the wait, so where's the line? This is the line, okay. You can see all the curves here. Um so unfortunately, New York to Binghamton is really hard, but this should also not run 
every two hours, which would run every hour, maybe every half hour. Uh, but it's a very long line, so uh, it's going to be like three hours if you do it very, uh, very well, almost to the point that it's probably going to be faster to do New York to Syracuse on a high-speed train and then go down here, possibly. Um, but remember, you're connecting to New York. Hourly trains on things that connect to New York might not be frequent enough if everything is done correctly, because uh, remember how I keep talking about things like Boston is the entire is the population of Norway? Well, metropolitan New York is the population of Norway and Sweden and Denmark combined. Not for long, though, because in the Nordic countries, the population is growing thanks to immigration. In New York, the population is uh, not growing fast because the net migration rate is actually negative. Uh, lots of international immigration, but net negative domestic migration due to uh, insufficient quantity of housing being built, whereas Sweden and Norway both build quite a lot. Might want to work on that, New York. But, I mean, it's a, it's a question of level, not rate of change. Um, so that is the two-hour issue. Again, don't run two hours in the interesting... Oh, yeah, the Bethlehem branch might be better. I'm not sure. I've, I mean, this is probably something that should be studied at one point, and I worry that I will have to be the person studying this. But um, like things like how to do New York, uh, how to serve Allen Terminals. I mean, again, everything connecting to New York will fill. I'm going to get to that in a second when we talk about commuter rail in New York. But um, so, uh, so whether... New York Scranton is better via Allentown or via uh, um, or via Delaware Water Gap. I don't know. The current plans are Delaware Water Gap, but I don't know to what extent I trust them. Um, so anyway, that's Boston. So again, there's progress. It's just government by pilot with all the problems that entails. Philadelphia, I don't have the full deck. Um, I'm going to rely on the posts by Ben Shah, who is a member of the Transit Matters of Philadelphia, which is called Fifth Square. They are a very good uh, technical uh, advocacy group for better uh, service within the Philadelphia region. The Philadelphia region, I must add, is the opposite of Boston in the sense that, first of all, it has a very local-focused commuter rail system. Um, many branches don't leave city limits. Uh, so it's not just the Fairmont line, it's a bunch of lines. Second, uh, they uh, are fully electrified and have been since... So these lines have all been electrified since the 30s, but they uh, curtailed service past the point of electrification in the 80s. So technically the system has only been fully electrified since the 80s, but these lines have been for much longer. Philadelphia was an early electrifier, like, uh, for example, Berlin. And... Uh, there's also a tunnel connecting the two historic terminals, like the North-South Rail Link. Rather, the North-South Rail Link is like this tunnel. It's called the Center City Commuter Tunnel, I believe. Connection. So, CCCC. Uh, this was built in the 70s and 80s. 78 to 84. Uh, and ridership did not rise because it opened somehow at the same time that it was a very long strike. Um, but uh, so they have all of the physical infrastructure for what I call commuter rail AES. -bahn. Unfortunately, the, uh, there is no fare integration, there is no timetable integration, there are not enough stops within the city. Uh, some of these lines run right next to the busiest bus in Philly, the 23. Um, so it's in this direction, but they offer little service, not very frequent. Uh, I don't know if all of the stations even have level boarding in the city. Uh, I know that many stations on SEPTA regional rail have uh, low platforms. I do not know which ones though. Uh, and uh, the fares are premium, so uh, there's this transit apartheid again one fare for Don Draper, another fare for his wife's maid. Um, and uh, the 
Uh, so, so the so it's called septal region. I remember I said in American activist lingo, commuter rail means it only runs or almost only runs at rush hour and is separate from urban rail and regional rail means uh, that it is uh, and, and regional rail means it is more modern. Well, why do they call it regional rail? Because they opened this tunnel and intended to run a uh, train every ten minutes on each named branch. This was the plan by uh, UPenn professor, at this point emeritus, he's very old, Vukan Vucic. And uh, uh, he even he modeled this explicitly after the uh, uh, German S-Bahn systems. Berlin was old, but at the time uh, Munich had just opened and provided the blueprint for uh, more value engineered, uh, more share track kind of systems. And uh, so instead of S and numbers, like uh, here we have uh, on the shot when things like S3, 5, 7, and 9, in Munich it's S1, uh, 2, and, and so on. So they use the same lingo, but it's R. So they use uh, numbers like uh, R7 would be the trains that go to Trenton, and then they would loop around and go to, uh, I believe, Chestnut Hill. Um, the lines self-intersected because the, um, it was two systems that were not on opposite sides of the city, like in Boston, it's north and south. Um, it's more north on the on what is called the Reading Railroad side. So this is the main line of the Reading Railroad. So these are so it's these trains, and uh, then both north and south entering from the west from the Pennsylvania Railroad side, and nothing east. Um, because east it was New Jersey, and uh, somehow the commuter trains in New Jersey never, or, or either never had a big terminal here that could be connected, or they did, and they didn't connect because it was a Pennsylvania state project, not a Jersey one. Um, and the thing they did connect is they built something called Patco, which is not commuter rail, it's a subway uh, that kind of replaces commuter rail in these suburbs. Um, okay, yeah, sucks at the Chestnut Hill West. Uh, Chestnut Hill East is low platform. Don't know really how Prague adopted S numbering. Yeah. Um, if you think this is bad, Beijing is worse. Beijing built the tunnel very recently and has the S numbering, and the, I believe the lines only run rush hour. It's not even running hourly off peak. I, I don't think they even run off peak in Beijing, um, which is weird because. Japanese planning maxims are supposed to be accessible to China. But evidently, they're not at this point. They're lost. Uh, and uh, uh, at any rate, so this is the situation in Philadelphia. So very good infrastructure. As a result, Christoph Spieler uh, gave this slide deck and uh, and giving the explanation that I just gave you, said, as a result, we have the best regional rail infrastructure in North America, and he is absolutely correct. Now, who is Christoph Spieler? Now, you can see, uh, oh, uh, I didn't intend to click on the link. Uh, he is a professor at Rice. Rice is not in Philadelphia, Rice is in Houston. He is based in Houston, uh, has been for a I, for the entire time that I've known him, so reading him going back to 2005, uh, he has been based in Houston. Uh, he was talking about commuter rail improvements in Houston. Uh, I don't know if he was born in the United States or in Germany, but he speaks German. Uh, he's very aware of German planning trends and has been plugging in the idea of better commuter rail since forever. Uh, let me see if I can find it. He used to have a blog called Intermodality. I guess not anymore. Ugh. He used to have, so he had two really good blog posts. The first was explaining that commuter rail can mean two hugely different things. He was comparing a three round trips a day, only at rush hour line in the Bay Area called uh, ACE Transit, Altamont Commuter Express, and with the Yamanote line in Japan, which is even more urban rail than the Berlin S-Bahn. It's one self-contained line within city center because all the lines that go into the suburbs run on adjacent track because it's Tokyo, so 
they have eight track lines there and all of these eight tracks are critically overcrowded and they should probably go 10 or 12. Um, so it's the first blog post. The second really good one is he wrote a compare and contrast between the Washington Metro and BART in the Bay Area and came with the conclusion that the Washington Metro was better for serving urban needs better. Um, so at any rate, this guy who has been banging the drums on commuter rail since before I got involved in this uh, is getting uh, hired to make a proposal for Philly in the next couple of years, which is very exciting. And uh, the slide deck, uh, so, so here's the, so, so let's go over the slide deck. In 84, SEPTA built the new tunnel and uh, this is where there's the best RR infra. Um, slight quibble, Toronto probably has better infra if you ignore that Toronto is unelectrified and Philadelphia is electrified. Toronto doesn't need a tunnel. It's uh, Union Station was always a first station and it's a better place. It's just, and it doesn't have the loop-de-loops there. It, it's just that Toronto has problems. So let's see. Uh, um, so they talk about, so, so, so here's talking about the, so he's actually talking about a suburban issue of uh, bus rail versus regional rail, but again, no fair integration. Uh, and uh, no good connections to uh, job centers that are not city center because there's something that, although again, I will also again quibble, Philadelphia is the most jobs probably traditional American transit city, um, much more so than New York. Boston or Chicago, or let's say San Francisco. Um, this is just slide, so let's not go over there. It's about, oh, you can use regional rail to go to not work. I mean, thank you, I live in Berlin, I know that. Um, and uh, uh, so frequency, it's important to frequency, not just at rush hour. Uh, improve connection points. Uh, so this is regional rail in the American term, so not <coughs> Regionalbahn, so lumping both S-Bahn and Regionalbahn, probably actually more S-Bahn, given the scope of the Philly system, which again is very small, I believe uh, about half the track length, half the route length of Boston, the ridership's about the same. Uh, and simplifying timetable, so ideally you want trains to all make all stops. Um, if you have express trains, you have one express pattern, not 10. Um, this uh, is talking about things that can be changed. Uh, Munich, as I mentioned, very important uh, to Vucic as well. London has improved things as well. Um, it's not as good as Berlin or Paris or Munich, but um, it has, like, it, its trains are frequent. It's just that they're kind of a spaghetti branching in South London, and they're very slowly fixing that, but very slowly. Uh, and they're building things like cross rail, but very expensively, so they can't do too much of that. Denver, Denver's weird. Denver built this high platform EMU commuter rail system that runs every 15 minutes, but there's no development there, so ridership is zero. Um, so this is why you do commuter rail. This is why you do commuter rail and not just build subways. Because commuter rail lets you leverage existing lines. You don't need to build new lines to where there's nothing. If you build new lines to where there's nothing, yeah, you do aggressive transit-oriented development, but Denver has not done so. Um, Denver's model split is not increasing, unfortunately. Um, so SEPTA is completely rethinking what the future rolling stock is, is going to look like. It's very good. And there are going to be possibly new infill stations. Remember that I'm complaining that there aren't enough stations within the city. So they have these three city center stations, Market East, oh, this one. Uh, this, is the historic, this is not a station. This is a historic riding terminal. But when they built the tunnel, they went floop, floop, floop. Or the floop, floop, this is Suburban station. It's called Suburban, despite being at the very heart of Philadelphia. Because uh, you see this kind of weird situation, the Pennsylvania Railroad ran the suburban lines all through here, so this was a suburban station. The intercity trains did this to run through from New York to Washington, so the intercity trains went to 30th Street, um, which is not quite city center, so center city is this, 
but it's slowly migrating west in this direction. Um, so the three stages, Market East, Suburban, 30th Street, and then Big Gap, uh, how much is it? Three point something kilometers to Temple. Uh, this is, th these are not two stations on the same line. North Philly is, oh, you might notice, North Philly is the next station that you're getting to from the Pennsylvania side. It's very long. All right, so it's this, there. Seven kilometers, first interstation. And there's absolutely stuff here or here that could connect that. So it's not like there's a reason for this, other than they don't care about urban service. Okay, North Broad is, uh, and you might notice that these stations don't quite connect. This is a kilometer point something, okay, and then long nonstop connection. I think the next one is here at Fairmark. So same thing, and then once you get to the branches, yeah, sure, then you have tighter stop spacing, but this is not the stop spacing that you should have, so they, and, they, and they recognize this, so they talk about infill stops, very good. Um, yeah, Denver is a weird thing. It's just, they're looking for North American examples, and now they're gonna, uh, and Denver did a lot of bad things when it built things, like it uh, rebuilt Union Station to not be a through station. Um, oh, and Seth was thinking about, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will also add something important about rolling stock. Um, there are good trains and there are American trains. And in fact, when I say there are good trains, there are two separate kinds of good trains, European and Japanese. The standards are incompatible. The Japanese ones are somewhat better, but the European ones are decently good themselves. Uh, the Japanese have better, very short stop, urban, basically a subway just within the city, uh, rolling stock for the needs of that, which are just very cheap and reliable. They have better high-speed rail than we do on the level of rolling stock. We have better medium-speed regional rail in between. So think if you need a speed of 130, 160 kilometers an hour, stops that are every two to three kilometers in the suburbs, lines that go 40, 50 kilometers out, buy from us, not from the Japanese, which it doesn't matter because at this point the American regulations have been harmonized with ours and not with the Japanese ones, so they can't use Japanese trains, unfortunately. Um, but at any rate... Um, despite the regulations having been harmonized, American commuter rail operators keep buying premium and low quality trains based on the obsolete American regulations, which have been realigned with ours since three years ago. Why? I mentioned managers who don't know very much. They don't know Munich has commuter trains. They don't know what this means. They're used to one thing. They're going to stick with it until they're fired. Um, and uh, or, or, or retire and move to Florida. Um, unfortunately, the latter is likelier, and that's going to take a while. And so the uh, situation is that even now with the regulations fully harmonized, the LIRR is buying M9s, which are uh, EMUs, but they're EMUs based on conservative standards aligned with the old, obsolete American regulations at a cost of 3.6 million per car, um, the cost per car should be 2.5. Uh, this is partly by America, but it's not really because these are huge orders usually, so setting up the factory is not going to be a problem. It's just weird design standards are not what the vendors build nowadays. Uh, New Jersey Transit bought bi-level trains called multi-levels that are uh, a mix of EMUs and unpowered coaches to be hauled by the EMUs, and uh, they are also compliant with the old regulations. They are also incredibly expensive. I'm forgetting how much. I want to say 5 million a piece, um, whereas a bi-level should probably be 3.5, but I don't remember. Uh, Boston, to its credit, because we've yelled at them, is looking at buying uh, trains that are compatible with present regulations. They're called something non-compliant, but no, they're not compliant with regulations that have been superseded for three years. So UIC compliant trains rather than obsolete trains. Unfortunately, they're, let's not get into the issues with uh, the Caltrain kiss right now. 
So in Philadelphia, they're thinking of getting modern EMUs. Uh, yeah, yeah, the fact there are three stations. Yeah, there, there are no connections between commuter rail and subways, even when they should be co-located. Um, sometimes there is a sporadic one like Jamaica, but it's an afterthought, unfortunately. And yeah, um, there are bad American EMUs. The, um, yeah, the Silver Line RVs have good initial acceleration, actually. It's just that they're very heavy, so they're good up to 100 kilometers an hour, and then they drop off, and they're also more expensive to operate. Um, but... Um, you should just not get that again. I mean, get things that have the same performance and weigh two thirds as much. Literally, the, the Silver Line RVs are, I think, 65 or 68 metric tons a piece, and a train that length, and, and a car that length should be 40. So less than two thirds, actually. Um, so, anyway, that's the Philadelphia situation. Um, Christoph is uh, giving some examples about. Uh, yeah, so diesel is the is, so Toronto is is diesel is the, is where Toronto where you fall Toronto. Um, so again, I don't know what exactly is going to happen because I am not a member of Fifth Square, so I don't know what the deck was. Um, so so I don't know what they're exactly planning on. Whereas in Boston, they can give you details even if I can't find the decks for this, just because I hear these things. People talk to me. Uh, so that's the better case. New York is the more compromised one, unfortunately. It's called Freedom Ticket. You see, in New York, they have the worst city-suburb hostility. They have the worst kind of uh, agency turf battles involving the two separate commuter rail operators. Actually, three, because of New Jersey Transit, but even on the New York state side, uh, the two, despite having a shared suburban hate of the city, don't even cooperate with each other. They're very localist this way. Um, which you can think of it as ideologically. It's kind of an ideology that has local control that rises to maintain segregation because you can't have... I mean, so people in Long Island are probably not going to be too unhappy about, let's say, I don't know, school integration with very, with other very rich suburbs, but the more you integrate the schools with other rich suburbs and you do a pan-suburban identity, suddenly it's something where you could threaten integration with the city. So to prevent integration, they stay hyper-local. Even worse than Chicago? Yes. Um, yes, it, it is, I think, worse in Chicago and New York. Um, at any rate, so in New York, they're doing things in much smaller steps. Um, so let's talk freedom ticket, which is a good thing, to some extent. You see, in New York, remember how I mentioned at the beginning of the video that um, you have uh, a, uh, what is it, from, from Jamaica to... Uh, Let's look at that again. I believe it's $239 monthly. And if you're not on the monthly, then... What the... I don't want specific. Daily, weekly, and monthly. But you're not telling the right thing. Yeah, where was it? Oh, here. So remember Jamaica to Manhattan? Oh, it's not 239, it's, two, it's not 237, it's 234. Okay. On the subway, it's, a, it's 100, I think it's 127, 121 maybe? Yeah, 121. Um, so it's almost a factor of two difference, and it's much more if you ride uh, only once. Uh, because one way is 775 versus 275. So these are because so if you're trying to experiment, you're shafted. Um, and Metro North, uh, it's more convoluted, but you're going to see something similar. So Hudson and Harlem, that's um, so within the city, it's okay, 216. Uh, and then it rises as you go into suburbia. One way, it's even worse than the LIRR. I mean, okay, sorry, the peak, but off-peak is maybe a little bit better. Um, so 
not very user friendly. Uh, and again, it's apartheid fairs, um, practically by design. Um, you talk about fair integration and people are saying, well, but there are going to be people from the city and there's a camaraderie for us in the suburbs, but if someone's only writing for 20 minutes and we're going to have to stand, this is literally what I hear on Twitter, um, repeatedly. And this is also what you're going to hear at community meetings, to which a solution is stop holding community meetings, nothing is learned there. And this is true for literally everything. More community meetings, less progress. Fewer community meetings, always better. Even if the planners are racist, the community meetings will not fight the racists, they will reinforce them. Very important to understand that. Um, yeah, the problem in New York is not construction costs. This is what I'm trying to explain. Um, I mean, it's a problem, but it's not the reason why they're doing little steps. So the, let's talk about the little steps. So Freedom Ticket is coming from City Ticket, where the idea is that um, this is a I'm not going to go through any 58 page video. Um, so let me just say what they're being, what they're doing. Um, so the Atlantic ticket is five dollars. Uh, they don't say what the monthly is. They say the weekly is sixty versus thirty three on the subway, and the sixty incorporates the subway transfer already. So uh, right now. If you're on a monthly, you spend twice as much normally, and it's three times as much with a subway transfer. Here, they're cutting you from three times as much to only twice as much with a subway transfer. Um, and the idea is to uh, is to not let you into Penn Station because, again, it's dismantling apartheid, but only partly. Um, instead, it's uh, getting you to Atlantic Station from stations elsewhere in the city. Um, so not where a lot of suburbanites are, because the suburbanites mostly are going to be going to Penn Station. Now, they are expanding to Penn Station. Um, and unfortunately, it's uh, it's used as an off-peak thing, I believe, not as a peak thing. Um, so it's, again, it's a half measure. Again, it's half measure, it's better than a zero measure. But by definition, a half measure is less than a full measure. Um, so again, they're improving, but much more slowly than in Boston and Philadelphia, which two are improving very slowly. It's all done as pilots. So here, City Ticket, or Atlantic Ticket began as a pilot. And they saw, oh, ridership increased. Okay, let's expand this. They don't ever think in terms of standards that can be copied. It always has to be relearned. The wheel must be reinvented by New York managers, by New York commuter rail managers, who in a city where a large fraction of the population speaks Spanish will never once deputize Hispanics to go into Spain and learn how, um, the, uh, how the Sarkania system works. Um, so um, all, all about like slowing down social change to the ability that the existing crop of not very good managers can implement it, which is not very extensive because the because these are not good managers again. Um, and so the so this is a situation in New York. So again, things are happening in New York, but much more slowly, um, much more haltingly. Um, the um, like I mean, there's nothing in New York like uh, like TM or like uh, or like Fifth Square, unfortunately, at least not yet. Um, but the um, but also there's just much more intransigence there to the idea of learning from other people. And yes, Richard Mlynarek is way too nice for people who don't know who Richard Mlynarek is. This is Richard Mlynarek. Read this. I'm gonna give you guys like a minute to read all of these. And when I say that he is too nice, this is by the way all from 2008. Uh, when I say he's too nice, I would like you to understand my full meaning. Oh, and he complains. Uh, he recently sent me an email complaining that he has small errors in this design, uh, nothing important, but little uh, in, uh, little errors in uh, how we do certain things. 
Um, yeah, so um, New York, again, things are happening, but much more haltingly, unfortunately, um, because of a much more intransigent base of people who think that the commuter trains are theirs by right. And uh, it, it gets to the point that um, Penn Station access, so that is, uh, what is Penn Station access? So uh, remember I mentioned earlier uh, that the LIRR only goes from Penn Station due east like this. So the first branching goes here. This is, so this is for commuter trains, sorry. This is not for commuter trains. I apologize. This is for intercity trains. This is the Amtrak route to New Haven. Commuter trains don't use it because it's slightly slower and less centrally located than the main route of the New Haven, which was always going to Grand Central. But there's no connection between Grand Central and Penn Station. And even if there were, it would be more important to run it for um, uh, commuter trains, in my belief. Like I, I can see one being built also for, for intercity, but I think it is a bad idea. Um, and so uh, there are plans to use this for commuter rail as well. It's called Penn Station Access. It was a Cuomo project, uh, one that led to the uh, job loss of uh, the LIRR president, Helena Williams. Why? Because uh, Cuomo wanted it. The LIRR, including the Long Island Honchos, opposed it because these are Metro North trains entering Penn Station via the same tunnel as, Long as the LIRR a tunnel that is not anywhere near capacity. Uh, peak traffic is 40, 41 trains an hour for Amtrak and 36 to 37 LIRR. And uh, capacity would be about 48. So this tunnel, it's only two tracks, not four tracks like here. And this is uh, 24, 25. Despite this, the LIRR people opposed the project because of turf battles. Uh, and everyone says, well, you can't without offering them some kind of compensation, blah, blah, blah. Well, Cuomo, but Cuomo cared about this. So Helena Williams uh, works for the LIRR in the position for which she is the most competent. That is not at all. Um, and unlike things like the LaGuardia uh, air train, which is at this point dead. So the, Cuomo also had this idea to build an air train to LaGuardia in this direction and not here toward Manhattan. This was hated by everyone, so uh, once Cuomo, too, uh, got the job in New York that is uh, most beneficial for the uh, welfare and the benefits and the progress of the, of the state and its residents that is none, uh, his piece of paper replacement, Kathy Hochul, canceled it. But... Uh, this is not being canceled because it's actually a good project, just too expensive. And even this project, again, has this kind of turf battles because Metro North versus LIRR. And so um, in New York, just things are much more intransigent. And the like, I can't tell why, like, I, I can't give you an, a very deep reason for this. It's partly, it's, I think, the suburbs have a more developed pan-suburban and yet very localist identity. So pan-suburban, they all hate the city, very localist. The suburbs are tiny and very fractionalized and each runs its old school system, even with similar levels of whiteness. So the, um, so, so again, New York is more backward. Freedom ticket is much less, unfortunately, than what Philadelphia and Boston are planning, which to be very clear is still much less than a good plan like a, a, a like the Israeli plan has a lot of problems but they're aiming for actual full transformation and Boston and Philadelphia are much slower at this unfortunately um, so again the people who worked on this plan in New York are good people the people working this, on, on these plans in Boston and Philadelphia also it's just a lot of hamstringing unfortunately um, and, and so so again things are happening um, there's recognition that there's a problem. There's a recognition of what the solution should look like. There's a lot of reticence to go from here to there, unfortunately. Um, and that's what's happening in the Northeast. It's Again, it's, it's this kind of conservative idea that social change should only happen at the base that the current crop of elites 
in this case, manager, in, in this case, and when I say elite, I mean managers, I don't mean the, in the sense that every person who went to a certain uni is elite. I mean, no, I mean a very specific one. Um, um, and this is the outcome. It's, it's this kind of institutional conservatism, that's what you got. Um, at this point I'm done, I'm gonna take questions. Uh, if I can end this at 8.10, it will be nice for the exact two hours, but if not, not terribly important. And as usual, I give people time to ask questions because it takes time to think, takes time to type. There's a little bit of a lag, so. LNK. Any opinion on urban rail in the United Kingdom outside London? Um, my understanding is that it's not very good, but um, I can't explain exactly why. I mean, I understand. I, so it's kind of frustrating that in the UK, I understand the governance issues better than I understand the technical issues. The governance issue is that um, the um, is that there need to be some kind of devolution to the metropolitan counties, and so that they can run their own service. Uh, or alternatively, empower national, like, or apparently re, um, renationalize national rail and let and empower it to do that. Um, but usually, smaller things uh, probably require some kind of devolution. Unfortunately, it's, you see it's also in Sweden, where um, in there's actually more devolution. In uh, for example, I mean, there's devolution in general, but the, but there's much less state involvement. And things are happening outside Stock uh, outside Stockholm because Stockholm just overwhelms everything and they do France with uh with Paris. Why does the UK have integrated fares? Why does the UK not have integrated fares? Because uh the uh so bus rail even within London is disintegrated because they think they have capacity problems, which they do, but they think that having an apartheid system with one but with one fares for the bus riders and another set of fares for the train riders is a good thing. Um, in, 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 it, it, there's this thing in London that, that they're trying to make the system work worse so that fewer people ride it because capacity. Um, so um, so this, it's, it's a big problem where um, even on the level of design, not just fares, they're planning on building extensions that are deliberately designed not to connect to existing lines. So the Battersea extension, um, the, the battery extension being built for the uh, for the northern line, which is operationally really important and really good, and yet um, they chose the route of, so, so the Battersea extension is not going to be shown here, it's between uh, Cannington so Google Earth is going to keep not depicting this correctly. Cannington's around here. Um, and um, the so there's this, is it? Am I drunk? They're not showing me the underground stations, only the national rail ones. So, and the underground, yeah, this is Cannington. So instead of going Cannington, Fox Hall with the connection also to the uh, uh, to the Vic and then better say they're specifically avoiding this because they don't want to overwhelm the the Vic, the Victoria line. Okay, this is going to be really bad, so I'm going to see if I can find the London Underground. I mean, I can find geographic maps that are just fine. What I can't find is geographic maps that depict stations. Yeah, I have no idea what Scotland is doing. I don't know Scotland well at all. I don't know the urban issues there.
I was mouthing the word fuck, in case this was unclear. So, anyway, um, the... So, can you reduce spheres without cutting conductors? Probably. I mean, you should be cutting conductors anyway. Um, the conductors are a decently big chunk of the costs. Uh, and, uh, but they're not everything. There, there are many things that should be done at the same time. So raising frequency can be done with very little additional labor cost because of peak off-peak issues. Um, a lot of it, I mean, there are things that require a union fight to, for example, not do the thing where um, some train drivers deliberately pick lines that go off schedule a lot because then they get overtime. So in Japan, they get paid to be on time. In the United States, they get paid to be not on time. In Japan, people complain that the, the system leads to accidents. In Japan, they have something like one, and a, one to one and a half orders of magnitude fewer passenger rail deaths per passenger kilometer than in the United States. Um, a lot, and, and yes, I to some extent will blame the old-timey kind of system of labor and credentialing on uh, I will partly blame that for the higher American death toll. Um, so anyway, the um, so can you so you so yeah, you should just eliminate the conductors. I don't mean cut. I mean eliminate. I mean pink slip all of them. I mean hire fair inspectors. Don't even hire them from the same group. Um, then you might want to also replace the train drivers. Uh, again, who are used to playing overtime games, uh, but that's a separate issue. Um, like the need to do labor force replacement. I might do a separate video on that. Um, and again, it's not something you can pilot because usually the doing the half-assing situation is to do hiring freezes or two-tier structures, which make things worse because two-tier structures are bad for new people. And it's usually the retirees, near retirees, old timers who are the biggest problem. So you need to always make. I mean, generally, when you have a an institutional problem, it's the people at the Top, the people who are the most privileged who are the problem, not the people who are the least. And when you have a prestige hierarchy, this means you need to go after the people who are socially viewed as the most moral, the most deserving, the most... In America, it would be middle class, because in America, middle class means uh, not homeless and normative. Uh, the, the people who will, people will write sob stories about these are usually the ones you need to fire. Um, and if you can't do that, then you shall not have good infrastructure. Um, so um, this, is a, this is a general problem, a, a, a half-assing problem. But again, it's not, the, it's not everything. It's just an important thing that needs to be done alongside other things. Um, management, pro I mean, if I had to choose between getting rid of all of management and getting rid of all of line labor, I probably would pick getting rid of all of management, even though getting rid of both is ideal. Um, are there other questions, by the way? Yeah, uh, eight ten is obviously not going to happen. But as I said, it's fine. It's not a hard deadline. When there's a hard deadline, I tell you guys it's a hard deadline. As usual, I'm going to give people like a minute to think, uh, deal with the lag. How small can a city be to be S1 worthy? Defi define S1. Because remember that uh, Trondheim... Is Salzburg worth doing? Probably, yeah. Um, I mean, it shouldn't be an S-Bahn where um, each branch comes every 10 minutes and the trunk is every three, but um, interline a couple of hourly trains or inter or if you feeling wild, a couple, um, a few half hourly trains? Yeah, why not? I mean, Salzburg, also remember that, I mean, Salzburg is not your typical small city, because the typical small city the size of Salzburg in, I don't know, Italy or something, everyone owns a car there. Salzburg is historic. Um, and, and, and Salzburg, my, my recollection is that Salzburg actually has a pretty decent model split for biking and for 
um, public transport? So in Salzburg, the answer is yes. In the Salzburg-sized American city, just build more affordable housing in New York, by which I mean build more housing in New York. Does that answer your question, Bonnie? Um, are there any other questions? If there aren't any, we can wrap. If not, I can stay on for a little bit longer. And it's a little bit because uh, I have not eaten today. I'm going to take a, one, a final call for questions, and if not, then I'm going to just drop. Um, and then, as I mentioned, go uh, maybe food. All right, thank you all for watching, and uh, I'm gonna upload, um, and uh, I will see you guys uh, hopefully in a week. Uh, so stay tuned. Thank you for watching.